Now in our previous videos, we discussed how to find the equation of a straight line. We've worked with um, some different real world problems that involve taking two points, finding the equation of the line that um, joins those points, and then using that equation to estimate future values. And now we're going to take what we know about linear equations and add another layer to it. We're going to talk about systems of linear equations. So whenever you hear of systems of linear equations, that's when we're looking for two or more equations with the same variable. So these are still straight lines, but instead of one line at a time, now we're talking about two lines. So it will be introduced with this notation. We see this curly bracket off to the left, and then the equation 1, and then the second equation will be written below it. So they're vertically stacked. And in this case, I've written it ax plus by equals c. They also could be written in y-intercept or slope intercept format, so y equals mx plus b. Now to not repeat myself, I'm going to use different letters instead of m and b, but still representing the slope, let's say nx plus c. It could look like this. So your system of equation, look for these curly brackets, and then the equations are written to the right of those. And as we get through the video, we are going to see what the purpose of these systems of equations are, but for now, let's just practice working with them to begin with. So the whole point of a system of equation is to determine what's the solution. And you'll see with me soon visually what that looks like. Actually, let's take a break so that we can visualize that. To find the solution of a system, what do we know about straight lines? Here's an example of one. And my second straight line could be going like this, and in that case, do you see that the straight lines will never intersect? This is an example where the solution does not exist. Solutions are intersections. So let's write that down. The solutions equal intersections of the lines. So if instead I had this example, this is my second line, the solution is where the points intersect. Now one thing to keep in mind about solutions is because they intersect, that point is, by its very nature, in both lines. This point that I've highlighted in blue is part of my dotted blue line, and it's also part of my straight red line. So you can tell if something's a solution by seeing if this point makes both equations true. So here's our question. Determine whether this ordered pair is a solution to the system. I can tell it's a solution. Remember, this is always x comma y. If we ever forget what the order is, it happens to follow the alphabetical order. x comes first, then followed by y. To the system. So first thing first, to find if the ordered pair is a solution to the system, step one, plug in ordered pair. to both equations. Step two is see if result is true or false. And let's work this out and we'll see what I mean by true or false. So for my step one, I'm going to plug every x becomes a 3 and every y becomes a 1. So let's type that out. Two times replace the x with three plus one replace the y with one equals seven. So two times three is six plus one is indeed seven. Six plus one, it was supposed to be equal to seven. And for the first one, we get a true result. True result. So I'm going to put a check mark by the first one. Now let's plug it into the second equation. 3 times, okay, x is supposed to be 3, right? Minus the y value of 1. And it says it's supposed to be equal to 8, so let's check that out. 3 times 3 is 9, minus 1. I'm just copying the right side because that's fixed. There's nothing that can change there. 9 minus 1 is 8. 8 is equal to 8. That's another true statement. So in this case, the 3, 3 makes this equation true, 
and this equation true. If the result is true for both equations, then it is a solution. Now what do I mean by false? We'll see that in our next example. Let's work through it and we'll kind of flesh out what this means. So determine whether this ordered pair 2, 5 is a solution to the system. If it helps, write the x, y above it to help you keep track. So x becomes 2, so everywhere there's a 2, x I'm going to put in a 2. y becomes 5, everywhere there's a y I'm going to put in a 5. And I can just do this right off to the side. So y turns into a 5 equals x becomes a 2. And let's simplify this. The left side in this case has no simplification. It's just the number 5, so I just recopy it. But the right side could be simplified. 2 times 2 is 4 plus 1. Well, that becomes left side stays the same. 4 plus 1 is 5. That's true. So I'm going to put a check mark by this equation. And as a note, I can easily mark on the screen because I'm working digitally. But if you're working on your notes, you can write this out. Or if this was a quiz, you could copy out this solution on your scratch paper so that you can interact with it as you're working through the problems. Keep that in mind. Now let's substitute in for the next one. 5 equals negative. Okay, x is 2 plus 9. This can't be simplified further. We just recopy the 5. Negative 2 is a negative 2 plus 9. Now the right side could be simplified. Negative 2 plus 9 is 7. Now let's consider, is 5 truly equal to 7? This is a false example. 5 is not equal to 7, so I'm going to put a big X here. What we need to keep in mind is when we're determining if something's a solution to the equation, if it's false for any of the equations, it's not a solution. So if it's false for any of the equations, then it is not a solution. So this example is not a solution. Two five is not a solution to this system. And for our earlier example, just to recap, it was a solution because it was true in both. So this one, the point 3, 1, is a solution to this system. So let's just finish this up. I've actually written in an extra practice problem to give us a, one more chance to do this kind of work. So here's a system of equations, x plus 1 equals y, and then followed by 2x equals y. And we're asked, is the point 2 comma 3 a solution of this system? Please take a moment and pause the video and attempt this on your own completely, and then unpause to check your work. So we know we need to substitute in the point to both equations and see if we get true results or not. So x will take the place with 2. I'm going to use this color coding to help me stay focused. y will become 3. So everywhere there's the x, there's now a 2, so I get 2 plus 1 equals 3. y is now 3. 2 plus 1 is 3. 3 is equal to 3, so I get true for the first equation. I'm going to put a check mark to help myself keep things straight there. And remember, if they're both checked, it is a solution. If even one fails, it's not a solution. So then checking the next one, 2 times the x value of 2 equals 3. Now let's see, 2 times 2 is 4. Is it true 4 is equal to 3? Definitely not. That is false. So I'm going to do a big x there. And we know if even 1 fails, the whole thing fails. They have to both be true for it to be a solution. If even 1 fails, it's not a solution. So my answer is 2, 3 is not a solution to the system. So now we found the y-intercepts for and the x-intercept for our blue graph. 
Now with the y-intercept, we see it's actually down at negative 1, so I think I'll need to extend my axis a little bit, so I'm going to mark this as negative 1. That's my y-intercept. The x-intercept was at a half, so I'm going to mark that halfway between 0 and 1. So then I've got this line. Now the whole thing is I want to make sure I'm drawing to scale, and I want to, I could of course just trace something that looks like a line, but I would not be guaranteed that any intersection I found was accurate. So from this point on, I need to use the slope. Notice slope is rise over run. So for this graph, I know it's the rise over the run. So let's look at our two points. I started here at negative 1. I rose up by 1. And how far did I go over? 1 half, or 0 0.5, divided by 0.5. So that's my rise over run. So if I want to rise again, I'll go up by 1 over by one half would get me right here and I'm just gonna keep up this pattern until I find an intersection so I rise up by one and I go over by one half I rise up by one I go over by one half and that will tell me that for this straight line I'm going to intersect exactly at this point this is our solution which we know is the same as intersection and it is at the point the x value is 2 x always comes first, y value is 3. So that is the solution to the system. 2, 3 is the solution. So notice the way we did that is we graphed the first, we graphed both of them, finding the x and y intercept, and especially from the second one on, we used our slope rise over run to keep finding the next point on the blue line until we intersected with the red line, and from there we got our solution. Now this example does work, but I particularly designed it so that our solution would be at nice integer values of x and y and relatively close to where the x and y axis meet. There are many examples of uh, systems that have solutions that are not integer values, for instance, not like 2 comma 3, and or they're very far away from where the x and y axis intersect. In those cases, this graphing method of solving would be time prohibitive. So we need a way of solving that always works, even if our solution is not as nice and tidy as this one is. And that's what we're going to see in our next few pages. So we have two more methods that we're going to learn, substitution and elimination. I'll never force you to use one method or the other in a quiz or exam. You can use either method, they'll both work. However, I am going to outline in these notes why you might pick one method in some cases and the other method in others. There's kind of a natural pattern to the problems that makes substitution a better fit for some and elimination a better fit for others. So here are our steps for solving by substitution. You first try to get one of the equations in terms of the other. So you're looking for something like y equals or x equals. If it's already set up like that or you can easily get it that way, that's a good use for substitution. And then you substitute this into the other equation and you solve for the remaining variable. That gets you your first point. Then you plug that point back in to find the other variable. Let's see that here. In this example it says find the solution to the system of equations and it says use the substitution method. This is just a hint, hey the substitution is going to be the quickest way here. Again you could solve it with the next method I show you later but it would take longer. I know this is a good candidate for substitution because do you see we've got a y equals already set up for us? That means part one's already done for us just by how it's been given. So now step two means put this value, what it's equal to, in the other equation. So I write this as x plus, okay, the y becomes this whole 2x minus 1 because y is truly equal to 2x minus 1. And my goal in doing this is getting an equation in a single variable. So when an equation's in a single variable, that's where we can really get traction and we can solve. Notice x plus 2x, well, that would actually combine to give us 3x's. Minus 1 equals 5. This goes back to algebra. I can solve this to get x by itself. I would do the opposite. I'd add 1 to both sides. Remember, what's done to one side must be done to the other. 3x equals 5 plus 1 is 6. Now this 3 writes in by the x as an implied multiplication. To undo it, we would divide. And I get the x value is 2. So this is this step. From our um, explanation above, we found the x equals 2. 
And now what do I do is I take this x equals 2 value and I go back to the original equation that I had solved for and plug it into there because then I'll find the y. y is 2 times whatever x is, but x was 2, minus 1. y equals 2 times 2 is 4, minus 1, and we get 3. So the solution, remember it's a coordinate point, is at 2 comma 3, and that would be our answer. So as a recap, substitution is a good idea when one of the equations is already written in a y equals or x equals format, or it's relatively easy to get there. For instance, in this next example, it says find the solution using substitution method. I don't immediately see a x equals or a y equals. In both equations, the x's and y's are on both sides. However, I do have just a x plus y, which I could quickly subtract to x from both sides, and I would get y equals 5 minus x. So this equation is one where it's not immediately y equals or x equals, but it's very quick to make it that. And then what do you do? You take this solve for value and you plug it into the other equation. Remember, it's the other equation. Because we're taking this one and we're putting it in the other equation, so it's all in terms of x. Now here's where you need to exercise caution. Do you see there's a subtraction symbol in front of the y? This subtraction symbol means all of y has to be subtracted. It would be a common mistake to just write it like this. See if you can find the mistake. If I just write it like this, only the 5 is getting subtracted. But I was actually supposed to subtract all of y, and this is all of y. So to correct the mistake, you have to put it in parentheses so that you remember in your next step to distribute the subtraction through. This parentheses reminds me that the subtraction needs to go to the 5 and it needs to go to the negative x. So let's distribute the subtraction through. Negative of a 5 is a negative 5. Negative, negative x. You might have heard um, two negatives make a positive and that is true. So minus a negative becomes a positive x equals 1. So remember that tip, if there's a subtraction and you're substituting in, use parentheses to remind yourself to distribute correctly. And now let's combine like terms. 2x plus x becomes 3x minus 5 equals 1. So 3x minus 5 equals 1. Let's get x alone. We're going to move the negative 5 over by adding both sides. 3x equals 6. Again, we divide both sides by 3, and we get x equals 2. Once you get your x value, you're practically done with the problem. Remember, you then substitute that into the equation you solve for, because that will give you the y value. y equals 5 minus 2, or y equals 3. Now, to put it all together, the solution is always a coordinate point. So the solution is the point x value is 2, y value is 3. And you might be thinking, this looks exactly like our previous problem. It is extremely similar. It's the same problem, it's just the equations had been rewritten so it looked different at the start. And this was done twice to show you that you can have a problem where it's set up quickly to substitute in, or we have to do one step to get the y or x equals, but it still works out through the solution. So now we get to our second method of solving these systems of equations, and that's the elimination method. So the way to think about these two examples is we are learning different ways to approach the same idea. We're still solving systems of equations, but in some cases, one method might be more efficient than the other. So what you're looking for in the elimination method is systems of equations that are set up if you added them together, you could easily get rid of one variable. And I'll try to show that to you in our example. So the goal is to add or subtract equations to eliminate one of the variables. So you're going to be looking for equations where the um, variables are opposite each other. Do you notice here I've got a plus y in the first equation, 
but a minus y in the second equation. It just so happens that if I added these together, the x's add to the x's, so x plus 2x is 3x. Positive y minus y actually will cancel the y's out. That becomes a plus 0, which I don't have to write. And then 5 plus 1 equals 6. Now this only works if you have the x and y variables on the correct side. So for instance, the x and y is on the left side of this equation. So it also has to be on the left side of this equation. Now that I've added these together and the y's were such that they nicely canceled, I quickly get an equation in one variable. So step two is solve for the remaining variable. Divide by three and we get that x equals two. And now you substitute that value back to find the other variable. And in this case, you can substitute into either equation. There's not one that's particularly easier. I'm gonna substitute it into the first one. 2 plus y equals 5, so I'm going to subtract 2 from both sides. y is 3. So the solution is always as a coordinate pair. 2 comma 3, x comes first, followed by y. So this is an example where the system, as we were provided, was set up for the elimination method because one of the pairs of variables were kind of opposite each other, so that if I added both equations together, they would naturally cancel each other out. Now here, I've kind of written off to the top corner of our notes page two more examples. Based on what we've talked about, I'd like you to visualize which one is best used, solved using the elimination and which is a substitution method. We're not going to actually solve either, but this is just practice of noticing which method would be more efficient. I quickly can see here, maybe not quickly, but with practice you will, do you see we've got a 2x and a negative 2x? And additionally, the y's on the left side, the y's on this left side, number on the right side. This is set up to be elimination. Because if you added the two um, equations together, the x terms would cancel out. However, for the other one, we've got a y equals. That's set up to substitute that in for the y in the other equation, which is why this is substitution. So if you're asked to solve a system of equations, be on the lookout for those key distinctions to tell you which method would be easier to work with. Now early in the notes we've seen some examples of solutions to systems of equations and we've talked about how the solutions are the intersection of the lines. Now let's visualize how that can occur. If you have any two lines, there's only three categories of solutions possible. You're either going to have exactly one solution which we see pictured here. No solution in the case of parallel lines. These lines will never intersect. Or infinitely many solutions when the line, first line, coincides with the second line. Notice here they're intersecting at every point. So in any case you have three options. There'll be either one solution to a system of linear equations, no solution, or infinitely many solutions. And we're asked to determine in the sec next example if it has one solution, no solution, or infinitely many. And you do that just by solving the system. And if you get a single x, y point, that means it has one solution. We've seen many examples of that previously. Or if you get down to something that is never true, and we'll see examples of this. Don't worry, right now I'm just introducing the idea. If you see example of something that is never true, that means we have no solution. And then if you get down to something that's something called always true, you have infinitely many. So let's actually work these out and you'll see what I'm talking about here. So determine if this system has no solution, one solution, or infinitely many. Just glancing here, um, I don't see anything perfectly set up where I have opposite, x and opposite values of x and y equation to equation. So I think this would be better to do substitution method because I can quickly get the y by itself. So here I'm going to subtract the x from both sides and I get y equals 5 minus x. Now I'm going to substitute this value of 5 minus x into the other equation. Remember in substitution you solve for one equation and then you substitute into the other. So that will give me x plus 5 minus x equals 3 
because I'm adding it, I don't have to be so careful and do parentheses. It's only when I'm subtracting what I substitute that I have to be very cautious and distribute the subtraction. So x minus x, oh, that actually gets rid of the x's, right? x minus x is 0. So I end up with 5 equals 3. Now think about that for a second. After you perform the substitution, you end up with something that says 5 is equal to 3. Is that a true statement? No, this is false. This is totally not true. 5 is not equal to 3. So I haven't made any mistakes. Let me just check our work. We subtracted x, yes, to get y by itself. We're good there. We properly substituted into the other equation. So all our steps are correct, but yet we got to a completely false conclusion. That means that there's no intersection. Getting to the false conclusion, if you've made no mistakes, is telling you that there is no solution. Because what we did by substituting is we actually assumed these lines would intersect. And then that false assumption led us to a false statement, which means our original assumption is false. We actually do not have intersecting lines. So this is an example of no solution. So you'll know you get a no solution if in the course of solving you get to a false statement. So false statement means no solution. And there'll always be something like that, like 7 equals 4, negative 1 equals 2. They might be different numerical values, but it's something is not equal to itself. And that's how you know it's false. So with this next one, we're asked to solve the system and see if it has one solution, no solution, or infinitely many. So as before, let's just look at our system of equations. And I don't think this is very well set up for elimination because it's not negative 2x or a negative 2 or a positive 2x. It's a 2x and a 4x. These wouldn't cancel if I added them together. However, I've got just a plus y. If you ever have just a plus y or plus x, you can subtract the other terms to get a single uh, y by itself or x by itself. So I'm going to subtract 2x from this side, subtract 2x from this side, and that first equation would be y equals 6 minus 2x. And we know this is what I'm going to substitute into the other equation for y. Now in the other equation, do we see it's 2 times y? So this is another case where we have to be careful when we substitute. This whole thing gets replaced by y. And the equation says we multi multiply 2 by that. So I'm going to keep it in parentheses to make sure I distribute the multiplying by 2 correctly. So anytime it's not just y, put your substitution terms in parentheses and then make sure you distribute in your next term. 4x plus, okay, 2 times 6 is 12. 2 times negative 2x, if you check, is negative 4x. And now I've made sure I distributed everything by 2. We're good. Let's combine like terms. 4x minus 4x. Well, that's 0x, so that's 0. So I'm just left with, they cancel each other out, a 12 on the left side equals a 12 on the right side. Now look at that final answer. We haven't made any mistakes. And in the end, we got down to something like 12 equals 12. That's kind of what I would say is an obviously true statement. Of course, 12 is equal to 12. If you get down to an obviously true statement, 12 is 12, 1 is 1, 4 is 4, anything like that, that means, and one thing I might mention too is it's a true statement, but do you see it also does not depend on x? That tells you that you have infinitely many solutions. When you get down to a true statement that does not depend on x or y, then you know you have infinitely many solutions. And if we were to visualize this, these two lines, although they look differently, visually 2x plus y equals 6 does not immediately look the same as this, it turns out they're just a scalar multiple of each other. For instance, if you multiplied this top one by 2 on all three terms, do you see we'd get exactly 4x plus 2y equals 12? They're the same line in disguise, but if you graph it, it'd be the same thing. So at every point, you've got an intersection, which means we have infinitely many solutions. So in conclusion, our three examples, in the process of solving, if you get down to a true statement that doesn't involve variables, 
its infinitely many solutions. If you get down to a numerical equation that's completely false, that's a no solution. And the only other option is in the process of solving, you get a specific point, x equals this, y equals that. That's one solution. Now, our final examples are going to be applications of these problems. It's going to give us, in this example, a word problem. And we have to write the systems of equations ourselves. That's the tricky part of this problem, is actually writing the equation. Once we've written the system of equations, then it's what we've done before pr in many other examples, just solve the system of equation either by elimination or substitution. So let me walk you through how we might solve this system of equations. And the first start is the setup. So I've got a system of linear equations, so I'm going to draw my system bracket. It says a farmer has 100 chickens and goats. Now they don't tell us how many of each type, it's just the goats and the chickens together is 100. Now they nicely give us a reminder, chickens have two legs, goats have four, and there's 260 legs in total. How many of each farm animal does the farmer have? So this is an example, since we can't see the herds, we can't just count it ourselves. We've been given this um, strange pieces of information, and from that we've got to figure out what's going on. So the whole thing that we're curious about, how many of each animal do we have? In the end, we want to know the number of chickens and the number of goats. And in math, when there's something you want to figure out, that's what you give a variable name. And for us, instead of using x and y to help us keep things straight, let's say the chickens is c and the goats is g. So in the end, c, whatever that number is, is how many chickens there are separately. And the goats is g. Now we know together, if you take all the chickens and you add all the goats, that would give you the total number of animals on the farm. And can you look back at the beginning of this problem? How many animals were said to exist on this farm? A hundred, right? So that's our first equation. So we have our first equation, which clearly tells us that between the two types of animals on the farm, chickens and goats, we have 100 total animals. And now let's turn our attention to the next piece of information. It has to do with the number of legs on the farm. So every chicken contributes two legs, and every goat contributes four. In total, the total number of legs is 260. So to represent that, we have the legs from chickens plus the legs from goats equals the total legs on the farm. So if there's two chickens, they contribute four legs. If there's um, four chickens, they contribute eight legs. Um, ten chickens, they contribute twenty legs. The idea is because for every chicken there's two legs, we can represent it by two times the number of chickens is the number of chicken legs. Similarly, for every goat we have, they contribute four legs, so that's four times the number of goats. And now we see we have our system of equations. So the really the new part to these problems is just forming this system from the word problem. Once you have this, it's going to be either our elimination or substitution method. I don't think it's immediately set up for elimination, so I think I prefer to use our substitution method. And I'm going to get this equation by itself. Let's subtract uh, C from both sides, and we get G equals 100 minus C. And then this will be substituted into the other equation for the G. Now, I really encourage you to pause the video now and attempt this on your own. And then unpause to check out the solution along with me. Okay. So we need to substitute it in the other equation. So I have 2c plus, and now I need to be careful because everything in here is g. So 4 has to be multiplied by both terms. So I'm going to make sure I do that by putting the substituted terms in parentheses. And then do this like little distribution reminder. So 4 times 100 is 400. 4 times negative c is negative 4c. Plus 2c equals 260. Okay, now let's combine like terms. 2c minus 4c, those will combine to give us a negative 2c plus 400 equals 260. 
Now let's get C by itself. I'm going to subtract 400 from both sides. So 260 minus 400, get the order correct, and that's a negative 140. Negative 2C equals negative 140. I'm going to divide both sides by negative 2 because I'm undoing the multiplication. And we get that C is 70. So there's 70 chickens. And now to figure out the number of goats, we can plug this 70 chickens into our original equation that said the number of chickens plus goats must equal 70. So we have 70 chickens plus the number of goats equals 100. At this point, you might be able to see that it's 30. If not, you can just do algebra to solve. The number of goats is 30. So that's our answer. 70 chickens and 30 goats. So our next application problem has to do with revenue, cost, and the idea of profit breaking even. So suppose that we have a hard drive company and the cost for selling X hard drives or producing X hard drives is 8,000 plus 20X. So this is our cost function. And then our revenue function is 40 times X. And cost is in total dollars. Revenue is in dollars as well. Now, for us, we have this graph included as a helpful. And just a little note on these units. Um, because of space, the graph was written as the units are in 10 to the 4th. What that means is 10 to the 4th, if you type this into your calculator, is 10,000. So this is 10,000. This is 20,000. This is 30,000. And this is 40,000. So because of space, it shortchanged it to just noting the units were up here, but we might translate it that to help us see it more easily. And we're asked, how many hard drives must the, be produced and sold for the company to break even? We need this um, piece of information. Profit breaks even. when cost equals revenue. So this question is asking us, where do the lines intersect? Because that's when cost is equal to revenue. Visually, I can see they intersect here. But unless I was going to guess, I can't be sure what that x value is. And I'd hesitate you from guessing, because perhaps the scales aren't exactly accurate. You know, we don't want to just make a guess when it comes down to our problem. We can know for sure by solving the system of equation, because we want to find their intersection. So I'm going to say um, cost equals 8,000 plus 20x. Revenue equals 40x. And we want to know when they're equal. So this is going to be slightly different because we don't have the exact same variables, cost, revenue, things like that. But instead, think about the idea here. We're not going to do substitution or elimination. But what we want to happen, we want it to break even. We want cost, or C, to equal revenue, R. So we can rewrite this. Cost is 8,000 plus 20x. And what do we want that to equal? We want that to equal revenue, which is 40x. Now we can solve for what x value makes this true. So let's subtract 20x from both sides. We're trying to get the x's together. So we're going to use algebra here to solve. And we would get, we can move here for space, 8,000 equals 20x. This is being multiplied, so to undo it, we do the opposite. We divide. So 8,000 divided by 20 gives us an x of 400. So this tells us that we need to produce and sell 400 hard drives for us to start turning a profit. Before that point, our cost function, the blue function, was higher than our revenue function. So we were spending more money than we were making. At this point, they became equal. And then after that, we see the revenue becomes higher than the cost. So we start increasing our profit over this expanse. 
So our next question is more than how many hard drives must be produced and sold for the company to have a profit? Well, we know this value at 400 is our key point. At 400, we start to turn a profit for every hard drive sold past that point. So we must sell more than 400 hard drives to make a profit. So that's all for this section of material. As always, please reach out to me if you have any questions. I'll be very happy to answer any of your questions, and I look forward to talking to you in our next section.